is supposed to become more apparent. So we do do content mining. But with the help of the very comprehensive introduction keynote we've had, I want to go back a bit and go through a setting. I'm going to take several stabs at explaining quite where I'm coming from. So I start here, facts into a database. Now this is very dry, as dry as you can get. This is my first pass of what's going on. But there's a database somewhere and facts are going into it. In terms of what Kerry is saying though, this is the dissemination I'm talking about. I think of dissemination via filling up a database and then people being able to use the database. Facts. What can I tell you about the facts that interest me? Well, actually, very helpfully, Kara mentioned PubMed, the biomedical database. The facts I refer to are all going to originate in PubMed, a big repository of papers. And this is the penny plane version of what's going on for me. And it would be very satisfactory to Mr. Gradgrind. The readers of Charles Dickens' Hard Times will re remember Mr. Gradgrind, his catchphrase, stick to the facts, sir. But no one's going to get that interested in this phrase in those terms. Facts, database dissemination, all very abstract. So I need a second pass, a top of, um, a tuppence coloured version of that anyway to get a bit more traction on what's going on here. So this is this is second pass. And now we have scraped facts. Facts have some square quotes because well, we should be a bit scared, a bit cautious anyway. And they're going via something. I was very interested in John's comment. Via human last word. Into semantic format. And now we're getting closer to something with some realism into it. <clears throat> so there is some scraping, eye text and data mining going on. The facts in scare quotes because we don't take them entirely at face value. Human last word means there's a human being involved in, in judging whether the so-called fact is worthy of proceeding to the next stage. And the next stage a semantic format, it could be many things. It means that some meaning is involved, and that explains the human intervention, because these facts come from papers, they're in natural language, humans have good ability with particularly relationships, I'm talking about relation extraction, as human beings, they are able to deal with relationships. So what are we talking about? Natural language. We're talking about <clears throat> Alice being the aunt of Bob. Therefore, Bob is the nephew of Alice. That's being able to turn a relationship around. But we live in a much more complicated world. If you go to a family party, Christmas gathering, or whatever it is, you need to be able to analyze things like, oh, that's my wife's ex's ex or the fact that the half-brother, my half-brother, might be, might not share a parent with me at all, or might be my brother, full brother. And we really are quite adept at this thing, sort of thing. Scientific facts may, as presented in natural language of paper, be using this kind of convoluted, impacted relationship on top of relationship thing. Therefore, a human referee 
and a semantic format which pre preserves the actual meaning of the relationship you do mean. Well, now we're talking about something which could engender some trust. So this is this is building on what was said in the keynote and the Q and A. So the third pass gets me close enough to talking about what Wikifact Mind is about. So we've got sound snippets. So you, you're using search, you're using information retrieval in the form of research, and for us, because it's relations, you need allude to you need at least a Bob analysis. You need at least two things you're searching for and relationship postulated aren't there for whatever it is. So these sound snippets are bits of scientific papers put in context. And we're going via volunteer help. into Wikidata. Well, this does explain now why I'm here, because I've been working on Wikidata for getting on for three years. And Wikidata is Wikipedia's database. And it does have a semantic format. I do not have time to go into all sorts of Wikidata stuff. It's a big growing site. But here we have the actual um, scenario I'm talking about. So this is originating PubMed papers, volunteers. Wikipedia is a large online volunteer organization. And so people just go and help because they think that's what they should be doing. They assign themselves to task. tasks. Wikifact Minds this defines what we're trying to do here. I think that's got the point where I can actually show you some stuff about Wikidata as being relevant. So here we have my um, user page on Wikidata, the suit and tie. It was the 15th birthday party of Wikipedia. That was why I said suit and tie. Uh, this is what Wikidata looks like if you go to the front page. And it tells you 28 million data items. I'll not get into how the, the, that's counted. They're in some sense closer to 31 million, but they have a cutoff. Um, it's this. This is an example of something built up from Wikidata's data. It's, I'm trying to just get it large enough so everybody can see here. It's part of the ontological study. Um, side of wiki, Wikidata. What this is, is explain on Wikidata, certain things are classified as academic journal articles, not so many of them. There's a subclass called scientific article, which is certainly very relevant to what, we're do, what, what I'm doing here. And here are the subclasses, the subclass, scientific conference paper, a retraction research, systematic review survey article. So this is not Wikidata, but this is a tool that builds on Wikidata to display bits of Wikidata. It's a tool that takes information out of Wikidata and shows it in form that, that people can appreciate. Wikidata itself is a bit boxy to be looking at for any length of time. But that's a live tool powered by Wikidata and what I'm now going to show you is in a diagram um, what Wikifact Mind does, uh, technically speaking. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but we do see here some things which you mentioned before. These things at the top here are virtual machines hosted by Wikimedia Labs, which is an analytics place, which actually download papers from PubMed. And they go through and they scrape them. That is, they search them with terms. Next stage down here, elastic search, is simply about organizing what you've then got. Here we have an API. Now, um, 
as I'm supposed to be working on this, I have to have an explanation of API. It says, all your questions will be answered. Please form an orderly queue. That is, here in Elasticsearch, we have a lot of information about the, the um, scientific literature and the search stuff and the text and data mining has been done. The question is, how do people from outside apply to get that information? The answer here is, there's an API. And possible applications of the API, which anyone can come and use, it's public, include things on Wikidata. Now, as I say, I don't really want to labor the technical side of this. For one thing, you need to uh, talk about that to my project manager, who actually is the software guy. I'm the Wikipedia guy, so I'm the guy who is doing work trying to support a volunteer effort which, which will actually do the final stage of moving things into Wikidata, which can then be used, reused in numerous ways. So that's by way of introduction of the WikiFactMind project. Human intervention is very much what we need in order to get typical scientific statements into Wikidata through a kind of refereeing process. I think with that build up, you can see why well, I then want to move on and discuss the reliability, either trust. And I, I really, really want to um, emphasize three points here. The first one is, what have we got? So we call the A, B, C or something. The software way of um, talking about, and Wikipedia to some extent too, way of talking about uh, reliability is you need to have enough people looking at your information. Because if nobody ever looks at it, it might be wrong and nobody would ever even notice eyeballs. Here we've got one volunteer allowing things through. Is that good? Well, volunteers are fallible, but there are some conditions under which volunteers work better and worse. The um, the referencing issue kind of not coming from the software world but for the academic world um, is considered absolutely key to um, reliable re no, footnotes the way you make your papers reliable yes but there's also what you might call new science we're dealing with, with um, scientific papers, my facts were in scare quotes, that may have been what was believed 20 years ago, but it might not be now. So how are we going to deal with that? Um, firstly, because the facts are coming from the scientific literature is kept in a repository, you can carry, you can carry, you can carry the references along with you all through the process, so when you add them to Wikidata, you add them in referenced fashion. Secondly, that's going to help with your issue about that was the old science, what's the new science, because you'll have a date, you hope. And some good news here, and this comes out of Wikifact Mind, because it's been done by, by my colleague Tom Arrow, is that Wikidata itself, which is as broad as Wikipedia is, it's encyclopedic, and then more so, actually, has um, items about particular scientific papers and in the past few months the number of those items has gone up from, from about half a million to well over a million. Ah, it's doubled. The number of, of um, papers which have a dedicated Wiki, uh, Wikidata item, a reference number, is now rising fast because of new tools, new technology and the references are therefore being built up directly, again from PubMed, um, 
good referencing and uh, citation information is being built up in Wikidata. So the trust which will exist in Wikidata um, for as, as a place that knows about the literature, that can tell you about the literature, can can do referencing easy because the easily because simply a link will link you to the full details of the paper, including, we hope, in time, um, enough information about the authors. That is coming along. And the, the third thing here, which gets to a key part of what I wanted to say, is about precision and recall. These are technical terms. These are technical terms used in, at least in the extractive part of the TDM world that I'm used to, about false negatives and false positives, which is, comes from medical statistics rather than uh, the data world. So I want to turn over here and do a diagram, a big graph, two axes. Because this is quite telling in terms of actual ambition. Precision along here. I was talking about this coffee beforehand. What, what is an acceptable degree of accuracy if you're putting facts into a database? 90 something percent and then somebody says, well, if it's only 96 percent, I'm not impressed because that's 4 percent nonsense going in there. But that is with a completely automated system. So in, in some sense, and in, in this, is, this is clearly part of the culture, people look at this one measure of the facts you're extracting, exactly what proportion do you think are correct? Is it well over 90%, 95%? It's clear, certainly reading the literature on relation extraction, the problem I'm talking about in an underlying way, that people want the largest precision possible. But that's only one dimensional of a two-dimensional two problem. And the other problem here called recall, this could be defined as saying, how much of the good content are you scraping out? How successful is your text and data mining at getting the facts you're interested in? Because it's obviously quite possible to get a very precise but very selective um, set of facts out simply by taking the easy cases. That is the case where the language in which things are expressed makes it absolutely clear what's going on. So I want to distinguish what we are doing from people who are simply focused on precision. But maybe I should just give some homely, more homely um, explanation of what's going on here. When we read a newspaper, our daily newspaper, the paper we usually read, we rarely read anything we're not interested in reading, and we stop reading when we think it's rubbish. So we are typically operate an area down here where of what we extract from the newspaper, very high proportion is what we want to extract. And very little of it is you know, gossip, which wouldn't interest us because we edit via the headlines. If we're not interested in sport, we don't read the sports section, frankly. If we are, that's what we read. That's one experience of high precision. High recall, low precision, in this diagram, corresponds to the untutored person's view of the web, where you go on the web and there's all sorts of facts, and as far as you're concerned, it covers more or less everything except there's very little about the actual problem we're researching, which is why you need research skills on the web. So down here is something we're familiar with in terms of old-fashioned media. Up here is an area very familiar with, with the web. We do have to remember what the underlying, well, at least for wiki fact mine and content mine, the underlying business here, which is to understand, to, to head towards this top corner. Because the top corner there, 100% precision, 100% recall, is actual reading. It's actually reading of a scientific article where you extract the useful facts and only the useful facts and you don't miss any out of the significant content. 
This is exactly what you don't do with the daily newspaper. You do not read it cover to cover and get everything out of it. But it is what the ambition of having a really good TDM system for the scientific which it should be. So bearing in mind that this top corner is really interesting, and this bottom corner is, you know, we know what that is, but it's not what your best ambition could be. I'm going to just put some typical figures in here. If you've got a TDM project which is high recall and only about 50% precision, that is half of what you're uh, producing is garbage, where do you go? Because there's the temptation to go for another 10 or 20% of um, precision, get to about 70%. And on the other hand, you could go to slightly less precise things, but by not scalping the content, by not removing from your consideration a lot of the content which might well be interesting. And the point about this is that if you want to publish a paper on benchmarking some classic problem, you do this, and then by good engineering, you, you, you push up to a few percent more than the previous published thing. If you want to do what we're doing, which is to involve volunteers, you do this, because why? Because when you are asking volunteers to approve a fact, so it's supposed fact or not, they're okay with that if two-thirds of the time, so 67% or whatever it is, if you've got the point where two-thirds of the time it's okay, you can let it through, and one-third of the time you say that's no, wrong, then they'll be alert, they will constantly be looking for the problems. If you've got the stage where it's 95% correct, you're actually not helping with that issue because one time in 20, they might slip up and feel really, really bad about themselves because they, they're mostly just going click, 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 yes. So on this diagram, I think you can understand a contrast between the kind of TDM results which are publishable as our algorithm is great and the actual achievement of results in the terms that we want which is to use human intervention to do the business of reducing the noise, reducing the bad data because if it's 95% correct there's still 5% rubbish and I think most people are not very happy about that. If you've got good volunteers who are alert on the job you will um, you will prosper if you can get the precision up to about two-thirds when the job becomes interesting and rewarding and a re real job. And this is really the point I wanted to get to, which is that if you're factoring in volunteers, Wikipedia-style volunteers, you have to bear that in mind about everything. That people will not assign themselves to do this work unless they want to. And I thought I'd end by something I was told yesterday by a friend of mine, actually like me, a Cambridge mathematician, he did end up at GCHQ. So when he talks about security matters, I, think I take some notice. He says, everybody has the experience of um, luggage scanning airports these days. He says they put in some false positives. They deliberately have systems, I have to believe him, he's an old friend, put in systems which superpose a picture of a gun on someone's case or something, just to keep the operatives alert. Because... You really, really want them to spot the one time in a thousand or ten thousand. There is, <laughs> is something that shouldn't be in someone's suitcase. And if it's a simply a, a mind-bogglingly dull job, you will not get good results out of them. I'm saying something which is obviously less important to human life and limb than spotting guns and bombs on plane. But it's the same general psychology, which is if you're so distrustful that you simply emphasize one measure of how successful you're being and ignore the fact that your real success will be to get humans to intervene and help out. You have to design the job intelligently so that people want to do it, they want to do it well. At that point I can stop and the question.
I'm not streaming, so um, we just walk around with this week. Like, do you want to do it? I've got a question. But we're going to do it on the mic. <laughs> yeah, you need, to, you need the mic. Yes. All right, well, that comes out. And this is, yeah. no, they're just on that last question, or last comment about false positives. I mean, I know you're saying that um, in airport security, people are, it's a very boring, repetitive job, and so you need to keep them awake. Um, I'm presuming, however, in the instance that you're talking about, which is uh, sort of corralling volunteer service into making sure the facts are correct or che and checking things, that false positives aren't, aren't actually being put in deliberately, that it's... No, how does that manifest? What, what I was saying was, was in the nature of um, you need to get a whole two-dimensional view in particular, developing a system, don't simply um, say, or this is, this is, this is how about the, the low-hanging fruit that we use often in Wikipedia. If by narrowing down what you're doing, making your criteria stricter for the, the facts you're presenting to them, you make it a duller job because they're not using their own, for example, their own natural language capacity, an interesting way to see, oh, that's a turned around version, that's a way of expressing something in different language, then you are creating a sort of, um, it's a Fordism, it, it's, a, it's a conveyor belt where they're just doing one very dull job in, in a chain. You need a more rewarding job and therefore the, the idea you head directly for a rather better precision measure is short-sighted if, if this is your strategy. And there's a two there's a two dimensional thing going on here because the the, the, the stuff that isn't the lowing hang fruit is up here because it's it's true facts which are expressed in a convoluted way and you don't want to cut them out of the system just to make your stats look better you want to keep them in there and you want to use your human resources properly the kind of management issue but I think this point is not generally made because the engineering papers tend to publish benchmarks and saying you know we, we've done better than the previous algorithm. We are not doing, we do, in fact, the way of expressing it around Wikidata would be, we're doing a semi-automatic rather than automatic system. Different thinking has to apply because the semi is just as important as the automatic. <laughs> the human in intervention has to be thought of as, as um, having its own needs. Um, so it's a so the whole process is, as you say, in a way semi-automated. So for the, do you know where we are in where you are in terms of precision and recall for the for the automated part, and where does the human intervention part take that take you on that uh, precision recall plot? <laughs> Uh, no, frankly, frankly, we don't have numbers for you. It's uh, it's early days with actually doing this, but we were discussing this a couple before. And we, what we want to do is, in fact, is to design dictionaries, i.e., I, lists of search um, keywords and key phrases, which take into account that we want um, stuff coming up to be interestingly challenging in the sense that you've got two uncommon terms in a sentence and human has to tell the difference between you know this drug is now used to treat this condition or, or this drug is not now used to <laughs> treat that condition and remain alert because that's exactly the kind of mistake you would make with the machine you don't notice the not you don't notice an implied negative it could be applied in a number of other ways so no no real data I'm afraid to get your teeth into on this um, we're working on it. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> okay, I see it. Thank you. Um, Justin Clark, AC, uh, Department of Genetics, University of Cambridge. Um, so thanks very much for the workshop. It's really interesting to hear about kind of the design of how to actually put humans in the loop of this kind of text and data mining. So I'm kind of a bit more curious about the process. So, because I always na naively assumed that, and maybe this is true of other parts of Wikidata, that 
essentially people have put facts in by whatever means and then they're just kind of looking at these facts and maybe they spot a mistake and change it. But it sounds like much more here like you have TDM kind of going over PubMed papers and then presenting those uh, statements to volunteers who presumably to multiple volunteers who can then look and approve it or disapprove it. And is that kind of like the basic process or are there kind of other kind of ways you're exploring? Sorry. The basic Um, uh, th this is all very new technology, in particular the um, co-occurrence, that is to be able to spot two terms in a paper in close conjunction is basically only a month old. So the basic process is to get people to volunteer. But my point is, if you're going to ask people to volunteer, you do need to think beforehand how interesting the job is going to be and how you're going to make it interesting in particular you need to be in the situation where the volunteer is someone also specifying the exact task. That is, you work with the volunteer to set up the two dictionaries required to get two terms. There might be a gene and a, a disease, whatever. But, you know, say what kind of gene are we talking about? Or in particular, what group of diseases are we talking about? Say, for example, um, conditions in immunology, is that what's interesting? You're interested in cancer, that is. <clears throat> Another part of this is to customize, <coughs> sorry, is to customize <coughs> the task to the actual domain interests of people. This, this is the universal diagram that you're thinking about. <coughs> when would you say we will ship this, we'll give this volunteer. <coughs> but before that, that's precisely the stage of which we've heard about before, engaging the domain expert in the earlier setup. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, it, it, no. Short talk. Want to make one key point? Clearly, getting people to volunteer for anything is a question of asking them at the right time to do the right thing. And anybody who works in the voluntary sector knows this. But sort of beyond saying we actually want to work with people who have domain interests and tailor our dictionaries up retrieval stuff to their needs, not simply saying there's an API, go away and do it yourself. Um, it is clearly, and this is why I'm working for Content Mind really, someone who knows about the Wikimedia side of voluntary communities, by someone who spent 14 years on Wikipedia and, and about three months at Content Mind. So <laughs> you might say I have domain knowledge of my own, but uh, I'm struggling to keep up with the EDM stuff, but perhaps this makes me speak like this. <laughs> Anyone else have?